We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. Uh, to the podcast, Peter. Thanks, so, mate. Thank you very much. I haven't introduced you formally yet, but we've got <laughs> uh, uh, this special guest, Bachelor of Ed- you can correct me on any of this, Bachelor of Education, a certified financial planner, graduate diploma of business and sports management, a self-managed super fund specialist, advisor, premiership captain and coach, <laughs> uh, assistant coach at the Geelong Falcons, historically, and uh, this year, which is sort of the, the reason for this chat, uh, 25 years in the financial planning industry. So, Peter Burke, backer, PB, Berkey, dad, welcome to your podcast that you didn't know is actually <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks heaps, mate. Thank you. Yeah, 25 years, my goodness. That's, um, I think we've, I've reflected a few times. I thought my life as a school teacher was a lifetime. I taught for 16 years and that seemed like forever. And the decision to make a change was not an easy one. But then all of a sudden it's 25 years gone and that was you know, almost one and a half times. Well, it is better than one and a half times my life as a teacher. So it was a pretty significant time, 25 years. The good thing about a podcast is you can talk for as long as you like and we can just we can just cut it down where you're <laughs> rambling on. So, uh, Well, you'll, you won't have any worries about trying to cut stuff <laughs> out, mate, if I start yakking. So... Known to ramble, known to tell uh, long stories with well, lots of detail. Well, this is your this is your opportunity to give us a twenty five year plus history of of everything. And before we do that, uh, this is probably in line with the move into technology. We're doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, would Staring f- me, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> technology. Well, you the wouldn't have that I am. What's a podcast? Twenty five years ago. <laughs> yeah. what, what is a podcast? Yeah, well. It's, I mean, it's fairly new to me anyway, but it's very new to the world. And I think it's about technology, the internet, all those things 25 years ago when I walked in the door at the GIO offices in Moorable Street. I actually had to sit at a computer. And for me, that was the most scary technology situation that I'd confronted for a long time, that most of the things I needed to do, I needed to go and get an answer or find answers in, in your computer but even then, you compare technology then. I mean, it's just chalk and cheese. So let, let's let's you've jumped a f- f- forward a few <laughs> steps. Now mm. let's go. Let's go back. I know you always like to. Whenever I ask you to tell a story, it generally starts with you were the start first the born, first born of uh, <laughs> of, uh, of eleven siblings. But let, let's start there. So for those people that are listening to this and don't know anything about you, so you are the principal director of Burke Britain Financial Partners, but. Uh, 25 years ago this business didn't exist and going back now 67 years ago when you were <laughs> born yeah. uh is that right 67 That's years ago correct, 1956 yeah. 53 53 yeah, yeah. 53. my maths is better than yours still yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm not good with numbers <laughs> uh so let's go back yeah. to your upbringing your family because i'm not sure even through your upbringing that you would have ever imagined <laughs> that you'd be sitting as a financial advisor as a 67 year old in heaven forbid never would have contemplated no. so let's rewind to uh, horsham circa 19 yeah well, 1953 I, uh, my mum and dad were um, young r- young romance young in those days 20 21 and uh got married and i popped out about six months later so that was um, a bit of a a scare for the family at that time but mum was one of five girls she was the the second of five girls and my dad was an only child and they then bought this old home off a farm a little four bedroom weatherboard cottage and had it moved in by the oxen and dray shoved it onto a back of a big cart and carted it into town and put it on a block of land at 4 Federation Avenue Horsham and then subsequent to that over the next 11 and 11 years in one month sorry 12 try that again 12 years in one month we grew from a family of me one child to a grand family of 11 and i was one month beyond my 12th birthday and mum brought home triplets our last my last siblings so 11 kids she was pretty regular popping out a child every, about every 18 months my beautiful mum val and then 
had a short, a slightly longer break between the uh, the eighth child, Robin, and it was about three years later she had the triplets. They arrived, and as Mum so um, wonderfully says with her, you know, very beautiful sense of humour that she always had. They didn't invent the pill until after the triplets were born, <laughs> darlings. So that's why we had to had to have eleven kids because it was meant to be. So. And there's a, there's a bit of a story around uh, the triplets. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah. Yeah, again, maybe a little bit of personal recollections. I recall being with my dad and mum had been sent off to the X-ray department at the Wimmera Base Hospital to check because the doctor was worried about her size. Something wasn't quite normal. It wasn't a normal child, a normal situation. And we pulled up and mum was sitting on the chair outside the X-ray department waiting for us to arrive. And as we got up, got pulled up, dad climbed out of the car and mum stood up and just burst into tears burst into tears and dad's rushed across to her and I've got out of the car as a, an 11 year old wondering what the heck's going on and she's I can hear her saying oh my god Max it's three how are we going to cope it's three how can we have any more love enough love for three more kids and uh, turned out that those three were the heaviest in the world when they were born 23 pound 11 combined weight and still in the Guinness Book of Records uh, the heaviest ever in Australia which is pretty significant so it's pretty impressive. My word, yeah. I think they're only beaten by um, triplets born in Outer Mongolia somewhere yeah. <laughs> about a decade after our triplets were born. So uh, one of 11, the eldest of 11, uh, what was your sort of a high school? I know you had a very, very successful high school <laughs> career. <laughs> yeah, well, I was actually, I was probably a bit fortunate. I went through uh, high school a bit too easily. I was lucky enough to get scholarship in year eight and a scholarship in year 10, which was great for mum and dad because it helped pay for school fees, all the books and things, which was, um, I think I was the uh, only one of the 11 kids that ended up going right through to year 12. And I, in fact, did it twice. I was so good at it the first time, I thought I'd better do it again. I think my uh, my scores in my first sit at uh, year 12 were sort of around the 13 and 17 and 20 and 25. Uh, Not real good. I told Sam and Matt that you failed year 12 the first time. Is that wrong? Very much. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Oh, you did fail. My scores were like 13. This is percentage. Yep. My scores first time around were terrible. Uh, I only passed one subject and that was, uh, I think, physics. And so... I then went with a mate, decided school wasn't for me. We went off to Mildura. We were going to get a job grape picking. And after a few days of grape picking, I said, let's get back in the car and go back. I'm going back to do year 12 again. <laughs> no way was I going to do that for the rest of my life. Now, did you, you did night school, is that right? Yeah, well, I did a second year of year 12 and I passed fine. I mean, I got through, but again, it wasn't a huge motivation. I got through, did enough to get a reasonable score. But then a couple of years later, having been married and having your big brother Clayton arrive and... I had a mates I played footy and cricket with were the school teachers and they were encouraging me to think about something else, something other than just labouring work in Horsham. And I had a job as a builder's labourer. I'd been offered an apprenticeship as a mature age apprentice. But I decided to go back to night school and I did two subjects, biology and economics. So I did a third crack at year 12 and did really, really well. Got really good scores there, which ramped my average up and I was lucky enough to get accepted into science at melbourne uni so how old were you then 21 and a bit okay and a half, yeah so you'd been married for two years and clayton would have been clayton was one and a bit he um yeah, clayton when i went, we went off to university off to melbourne clayton had turned one in the january so we went down late feb mid late feb so he was 13 months old when your mum and i headed off to melbourne and so you headed to Rusden, is that right? Yeah, well, I actually got is it accepted still called, into... Is it yeah, still called Rusden? Well, I'm not even sure it exists still, but I got accepted into um, Melbourne Science, but I didn't really want to do science. And I was talking to some people, and they said, oh, well, a friend who was actually a, a year ahead of us down at uni and said, why don't you try Monash? So I went out to Monash and knocked on the door, and they said, yeah, your score is more than good enough to get into Monash. And then someone else said, but there's the phys ed teacher's course over the back at Rusden behind Monash. And that's really what I wanted to do. So I went and knocked on their door and they said, oh, I don't know what's going wrong because your score is way better than what we needed for phys ed. Yeah, we'll take you. So in the space of a few door knocks and, and asking for help, sometimes you have to ask. I threw away the science at Melbourne Uni and decided to do phys ed teaching at Rusden State College of Victoria, which was pretty handy because we used all the Monash University facilities too, including lunches at the halls of residence, which we weren't supposed to, but cheap lunches were great. So how, how long was uni? Four years. Yeah. A three-year degree done in four years? 
<laughs> one of those, <laughs> like actually, me? No, it was a four. <laughs> it was genuinely a four-year teaching degree. So I was at uni from seventy-five through to seventy-eight, five, six, seven, eight. And I was lucky in those days because they had studentships. So I went down without a studentship and we just survived on... What, what's a studentship? Well, a studentship was a guaranteed teaching position. And so the education department, if you're, um, if you're qualified, would offer you a paid... It was just like you work for the doll. You go to get paid a reasonable amount to go to uni. And at the end of it, you're guaranteed a p- position as a teacher. So we spent the first year just surviving. And at the end of the first year, I applied and got a studentship so I didn't know what I was going to do with with work I was just trying to be a qualified teacher but I actually qualified for a studentship after year one so I had the second third and fourth year I went down to the teachers centre in Glen Waverley I think down Blackburn Road Glen Waverley we used to walk down and quote our number and they'd hand over our (laughs) cheque that was a very old school hand over your cheque for your fortnight's pay um, and as a result of that, at the end of my four years, I just got this letter in the mail to say, you've got a job. You know, you applied for areas uh, that you'd like to teach at, towns or places where you'd like to p- potentially be a teacher. And I applied for a lot of different places, mostly small country towns, and ended up just getting this letter to say, Cario, you've been sent to a school in Cario. I didn't even know where Cario was. I had to look it up on the map. And it was a brand new school called Cario North High School. On Hendy Street, Cario. It was I began there in its second year. So my first year teaching, I had year seven and year eight kids. That was it. So the timeline is nineteen. Uh, nineteen, you had Clayton married. Clayton arrived, moved to Melbourne. Twenty-one, correct. Four years at uni. Twenty-five. Well, had I arrived by this time? Or yes, not? you had, mate. Yeah. yeah. So we uh, we had you arrive at the end of my third year at uni. Well, then. You were living in Warrigal Road in Oakley at this point. We had two years. Our last two years in Melbourne were at Warrigal Road, Oakley. 155, I think it was, Warrigal Road, Oakley. And uh, your big brother went to a kindergarten around the corner, which was pretty convenient. And you arrived 28th of December. It was first Christmas and one of the very few Christmases. Can you remember what year that was? 1977. That's good because mum had to text me today to ask me what year my I was born. So I'm <laughs> glad you remembered it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I remember it. Well, I just remember it. It's num- numbers I remember, years, dates I remember. But um, 28, 28, 12, 77. And we I spent that first, that was one of the first Christmases or was the first Christmas I didn't spend with my parents and family in Horsham. But we weren't going to go too far because you were due around then. So we stayed close to the hospital, which was Glen Waverley Private Hospital, where you popped out. And um, So I must have been about 18 months when we arrived in Geelong. Uh, yeah, probably 15 months. Yeah, so through the, you were a little right through our first, last year at uni. And I think I started teaching at late January, early February. So you would have been 13 months when we arrived here mm. and uh, found a house to rent in Church Street, just near the Minerva Road corner. Yep, corner of uh, Minerva Road and, Minerva and Church. Near Hearn Hill Primary. That's right, right next to Hearn Hill Primary. Your big brother went, he did his first year at Hearn Hill Primary. Yeah. Yep. Um, so had you been to Geelong before or not? <laughs> I'd actually been to Geelong a couple of times. My dad had an experience of Geelong when he was little. He went, came down here to do grade six and his four years of secondary school at Geelong Tech. He went to Newtown Primary, grade six, and then four years at Geelong Tech and lived just here in Villamanta Street, not far from our office in, during that time. That was during the war years when my granddad was off on the railways with the war effort, so Nana moved down here to be closer to some family. And we'd heard about Geelong and I'd come here occasionally with Dad for a holiday with friends out in Newcomb, our family in Newcomb. But that was about my only experience of Geelong. I didn't know anything about the place. And suddenly I'm sent here to live and teach. It was quite confronting. And you didn't just teach, you also you had a, a, another really good way of connecting with the community. You, you had a bit of a kick of football as well, which, <laughs> which helped. Yeah, well, I was, um, that also was a help, but it was certainly a bit confusing because if you know, Geelong, like any town... If someone hears that a footballer has arrived, and it doesn't matter whether I was any good or not, I was a footballer, so the footy clubs decide they've got to recruit you, and I was inundated with people wanting me to come and train with them, and I spent the first probably four to six weeks just trying to make a decision on what I'd do, because I knew nothing about footy in Geelong. And trained with several clubs, um, and one club that I trained with on the Tuesday night, 
turned out that the reason I trained with them was because a guy that I taught with called Tom Doherty lived next door to Don Matheson, who happened to be sitting there, he's president at the time. And Tom popped his head over the fence to Donny Matheson and said, you better go and get someone to go and talk to this bloke. I hear he plays footy. So that Saturday, Terry Emond turned up, knocked on my door in Church Street and said, you want to come and train? I did Tuesday night. I actually liked it. You know, the other clubs I'd trained at were all good. Were, you know, most of them were really good and good for this one. was just a particularly uh, good group of guys. I turned up again on the Thursday night because I liked it. I thought I'll train again and get a feel for it. I wasn't allowed on the training track. This little man with only half a hand just demanded I come into the committee room with him and sat down and Sir Donald, Donnie Matheson, who turned out to be one of my very best friends in life, just decided that I was going to sign there and then and become a St Mary's player. I wasn't game to say no to him. So, Can you remember what you were paid per, per game back then? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got $100 a game. Wow. Which was then pretty good when you've just come to a new job and we'd spent four years surviving on a pittance and... I think I played VFA with Oakley and we got 80 a win and 50 a loss. So to be offered a little bit better than that was quite extraordinary. Um, and yeah, and I had a fantastic first year. We won a premiership, which was awesome. Beat North Shore in the grand final in 79. Played in the grand final again the next year. Didn't win it, unfortunately. And a couple of years of assistant coaching there. And finals, we didn't play grand finals again. And then I decided for lots of different reasons it was time to move on. Um, I was hopeful of getting the coaching job at St Mary's which had been suggested it was mine but for a whole lot of reasons it was not offered to me and so Bell Park, a couple of good mates Jeff, Jav Jeff Javisky, Jeff Jarvis and Ivor Stephen who lived right near us in Minerva Road harassed the hell out of me for a couple of years and I finally relented and said yep I'll come and coach Bell Park. I think we need to do another. We might have to set up another podcast, a footy only podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we, we There's could, a lot we, more. <laughs> we could do a deep dive down the football. Uh, so, from 25, when you moved, uh, so we're, we're sort of moving to the yes, to, to yep. the the timeline of when you sort of took a, a left turn into financial planning. But uh, 25, moved to Geelong, playing football in the local community. And you told me earlier that you, you, how many years were you in teaching before? 16, mate. So I taught um, 79. I began teaching when I arrived here, obviously. And then I think late 93, Mr. Kennett, who was Premier at the time, decided that there were way too many teachers and he was trying to slash the budget. So he started offering voluntary departure packages, trying to reduce the teacher numbers to reduce their... The, uh, the cost of the budget of teachers in the Vic Victorian education system. And I'd been, got to the point with teaching where I just felt like I was perhaps compromising what the kids needed. I was starting to get a bit bored and cutting corners and felt unless I'm passionate and giving the best I can, it was not good for me nor was it good for the kids I taught. So I put my hand up late 03, sorry, try that again, late 93, I put my hand up for a voluntary departure package, but finding because I was a maths phys editor, it was a difficult spot to fill. So nothing happened. You had to have a replacement, otherwise you wouldn't get offered this package. So then through 94, it wasn't happening. I thought I might be resigned to be a teacher for a lot longer. Is this what they called a, it was it a 54-11? Is that what they no, termed 54 it? 54 is for the defined benefit scheme. So that was a way of getting a much, much better superannuation payout from your defined benefit scheme. If you pulled the pin you know, somewhere in the last month of your 55th year of life then the, there was an enhancement to the benefit but this was just basically redundancies you know, but it was voluntary it wasn't a forced redundancy and I think I ended up getting the equivalent of about, of about one year's wage about 40 grand is what my voluntary departure package and so, entitlement was. So you obviously departed with a plan you obviously had a financial planner back then and you, de <laughs> and you departed with a financial plan of what you do with your redundancy it was all, it was all mapped out yeah, very good question. Yeah, it's funny because your mother was uh, absolutely freaking out about me chucking in this regular job with a wage, but I just needed, I knew I needed myself to, to do so. And I had a really good mate, David Matthews, who was the head of the Geelong Footy League at the time. I was coaching the Geelong Interleague side at the time. And he said he had this opportunity to do, he was considering doing um, a master's in business and sports management to complement his skills. I thought, well, that's good. I've just got told I'm going to get this package. In November of 1994, I was told I had to make a decision within a week. 
So I made the decision and decided I'd join David and do this course at Deakin University, which happened to be Deakin Burwood, not Deakin Geelong. Whoops. Yeah, so we, uh, we travelled up and down the road together for all of that 1995 year. And that um, the financial planning benefit of having a redundancy meant that I actually had enough money to live a year, but no longer. So Just no plan beyond one year. No plan beyond one year. And I needed to do the second year to get the master's, but I had run out of money, so I needed a job. And so uh, enter uh, a man that we now <laughs> call uh, TD, or um, The Difference. The Difference. Yep. Yeah. All right. Beautifully known as Killer, Killer Leslie, my very best mate since year seven high school days. And just, just quickly on Bruce, just thinking of you today, mate, as you say goodbye to your mum, Alma, who's uh, the private f- service for Bruce's mum who passed away about 10 days ago. Um, yeah, Bruce had said to me for a little while, you'd be good at this thing, it's financial planning. And my reaction was, you guys are just insurance salesmen. Up your ass. I'm not doing financial planning. It, I'm not selling insurance. Anyway, but I got a bit desperate because I needed a job. And he said, well, if you don't embarrass me and stay for at least two years, I'll see what I can swing for you. So he introduced me to Richard Hughes, who was the, the manager of the Geelong region at the time. So that, I don't think we said that it, that was sorry. actually GIO. So, yeah, sorry, so Bruce, GIO. Bruce was the was he state, the state manager, manager the of GIO Australia. That's right. And then Richard was the regional, the regional manager for yep. the Geelong Western District region. Yeah. And Bruce introduced me to Richard, and Richard said, yeah, well, you can probably do something, but you'll need to go and start your diploma of financial planning. So I just fast-tracked, I think, the first couple of units of the diploma of financial planning, came back to Richard in late January, and he said, yeah, I think we can do this. And I walked in the door on the 20th of February, 1996, to the GIA office in Marable Street and as a financial planner, and I knew nothing. Well, that was a long intro. We've, we've finally got to the point where <laughs> planning. you've started as a financial advisor. As I said, that's good. Uh, so you started at GIO and we were talking off air beforehand mm-hmm. about the fact that just the comparative between technology. I mean, the fact that we're doing a podcast today, yeah. you were manually faxing checks for super contributions through to super funds uh, and everything was manual. Or if there was... You mentioned about the customer advice record when that when oh, that then, came in. Well, it was just uh, paper driven, and the technology we used, well, compared to now, it was just well, it was more than chalk and cheese. And as I said, I was scared because I was so technologically illiterate. I had to have a very good friend, Jeff Taylor, who was um, still a very good friend. Jeff was my mentor, and Jeff would sit patiently by me and just direct me what buttons to push and which things to open in the computer to try and get information. But that was the extent of it. We just had a shared computer that we went to to get information. But I started off, um, the key focus in those days was finding small companies that needed someone to look after their corporate super. And I had, you know, organisations that had maybe five employees up to 40 or 50 employees. And each month they would send in a piece of paper with a cheque that included all, which was the payment schedule for their super entitlements. And each person listed with their member number and their super guarantee amount and any extras that were put in by the individual, salary, sacrifice or personal. And I would take that. It was my job. You know, didn't have much admin support in those days. We're absolutely blessed now as planners. But I'd have to fax all of those schedules off probably two, two nights a week in that at the end of each month you would fax off all these schedules. And I'd have anywhere from 30 to 50 of them. And each, the fax machine was pretty efficient. It would take one piece of paper at a time and you'd manually feed one piece of paper at a time and you'd, you'd basically take a copy of the cheque and send it with that fax and then you'd bundle up all the cheques in a, an express envelope and send it off to Sydney where it was all then credited to the accounts. And you'd most, those nights would probably, anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, just faxing pieces of paper off to the corporate super area. It was crazy, and I, th- I, I laugh now about how people complain so much about change and too many are so resistant to change. When I began 1996, there was fairly ground-shaking changes in the financial planning industry at the time, and a lot of the guys who'd been around forever were suddenly complaining and choosing to move on because they actually had to have rec- records of what they did. They had to actually have paperwork 
that substantiated why they'd told a client what they were doing. And that paperwork consisted of a thing called a customer advice record, which was, I think, three pages. It was one for the uh, one for GIO, one for our file, and one for the client. Just carbon copies that we would manually fill in, and they had about six boxes that we had to fill in just to basically say what we're doing and why and who it was for and the amount we're investing and that was pretty extensive compliance requirements and people complained about that they thought that was terrible so i was probably lucky coming in during a period of significant change because change has just been the norm change has been the way it is ever since so you obviously did something right because uh, you made it beyond that first two years so bruce, <laughs> bruce was happy with you uh, and you actually became one of his uh, his better uh, recruits. Yeah. Too. So yeah, well, I was pretty lucky because again, I probably well, my I was terrified. I mean, honestly, the first four, six, eight weeks, I would be going to work thinking, "What the hell am I doing?" And I just promised my best mate Bruce that I wouldn't let him down. So I knew I had to persevere, but I was just I'd lie awake at night worrying about what I didn't know. But people kept saying to me, it's okay because other people don't know what you don't know. It's only you that knows what you don't know. So I continued. I was lucky too. The guy that was the um, the, the state, no, sorry, the national manager at the time, his name will come to me in a moment, um, but he insisted on education and so we were expected to do at least one unit of the diploma each semester. So I just continued to study whilst working and all of a sudden it started to click. I actually started to get it. And so the diploma is the equivalent was the equivalent of what then became the CFP? Yeah, well, it rolled through. So there were eight units of the diploma, and then you did a CFP qualification at the end. It's a little bit more extensive now with the full CFP. Um, very, very complex process you go through. It was a little bit easier then, but um, that's what it was, eight units that flowed into the CFP once you did that. And uh, Paul... I'm trying to think of your surname anyway, Paul. Um, Bruce will be annoyed at me for not remembering. But we uh, we were in, you know, we were told we had to do the education, so I did it. And I think it was probably about three months in, it started to to flow pretty smoothly. And there were other changes that were happening, Centrelink changes that were occurring at the time. Um, so I volunteered to run some seminars, and having been teaching, I was you know, had no issue about getting up in front of a group of fifteen or twenty people and. We just had regular seminars for people, education seminars, trying to talk about what was happening with Centrelink rule changes and um, superannuation rule changes like the spouse contribution rule where you could drop three grand in and I picked up some really nice clients that came along because of the seminars and have stayed still clients now um, with all of their planning needs, which is lovely. So how, how far into your time at GAO did you feel uh, less like an insurance salesman and more like a... An advisor, someone that could actually give people advice rather than just faxing well, checks. Yeah, well, I think I realised that um, a lot of what we were doing was about people's superannuation and investments and using the tax rules to suit them a bit better or get the best outcomes. And the Centrelink side of things, which is very much about providing benefit, helping people get benefits when they needed them and when people were moving into retirement to see whether they could get the best possible age pension entitlements and so on. So it all sort of started to fit together. <coughs> And I still was very um, averse to talking insurance, so I, I didn't uh, spend a lot of time talking to people about their life, TPD and trauma and so on. I spent more of my time talking about the financial planning side of things. I gradually realised that insurance is a key part of it, and I gradually accustomed myself to that, but I was still um, a bit resistant for probably a couple of years. Uh, I was pretty lucky because a couple of other people left during that time. They left the Ge Geelong office. I mentioned Jeff Taylor before. Jeff took a gig with a, um, an accounting practice in Belmont and went for about 12 months, and so his clients needed someone to look after them. And Richard Hughes, who was our local manager, sort of offered that to me, which I was... Maybe I was a favoured child, I'm not sure, but he offered me the chance to look after that small bundle of clients that Jeff had. Another client... Uh, sorry, another planner, Brian Lierke, who was, had been around for a fair while, moved off to work for Seabus in Melbourne... Brian's already gone to God from cancer, sadly, but Brian's client base also was... I was asked if I would look after them, and amongst them they had quite a few of these small businesses that were small company supers. And that just gave me a leg up and gave me a chance to talk to lots of people. As you can hear, I can talk 
pretty well to lots of people. So but, uh, I found the job was quite good fun. And there's a like a recurring theme of disruption, which uh, we're experiencing at the moment in the industry, but there was a, a, a reasonably big disruption that occurred. I don't think we've talked about this yet, or maybe we skipped over it on the timeline that GIO became AMP mm. and AMP made a decision uh, about their plan of workforce, which was really the start of the business that we're in today. Yeah, crisis creates opportunity, absolutely. I I had uh, 96, February 96, and then in 2000, or it had been bubbling around for a while. The big corporate entity, AMP, had been suggesting this hostile takeover of GIO, the little corporate entity. And I think they really just wanted to get into the general insurance, which is what they were trying to get GIO for. But it turned out once they, it actually it happened and they got the, the hostile takeover, it was very much resisted by all the GIO admin. And I remember we had a, um, a conference in Sydney right before the transition over to AMP. And it was all the leadership of GIO was really peed off about what had happened and disappointed about AMP taking over. And I must say, even back then myself, you know, the AMP brand, I wasn't that fussed about it. But I thought, I'll sit. I'm not going to cut off my nose to spite my face. I'll just have a listen and wait and see what happens. And over the next six to 12 months, I realised that maybe there was opportunities. And then they were, as we moved, I think, end of two, late 2000, that they made, AMP made it very clear that they really didn't want employed planners. They wanted planners who ideally owned their own practices. That was their preferred arrangement. And quite a few of the old GIO guys found it really difficult because they didn't want to lose the security of the employment. And I hadn't been around for long, so for me, I'm just looking at the numbers, and I had a, another great friend and mentor, Bruce Anderson, who um, sat down with me and talked at great length about the possibilities of being a business owner and planning and what we should be looking at if I was to consider doing it. So I ended up putting up my hand late 2000 and said, yes, I would. And it was a bit um, almost contradictory because I was in a position where I had to go and buy from AMP these clients that I'd accumulated, which sort of made it a little bit, it was a bit nonsensical when you looked at it from my perspective that I had actually built up this client base, but I had to buy it. But I understand how it works that way now, but had to go and have borrow what in those days was quite, quite a lot of money to actually purchase the client base. And then we moved, got a, a little office down the end of Packington Street, the north end of Packington Street. Got it all prepared over the few months to the end of the financial year on the 1st of July, 2001. We opened the doors as, back then it was PV Financial Solutions. And uh, that's coming up 20 years and July the 1st this year. Yeah, and again, on a, uh, the theme of disruption and uh, 25 years worth of change that the beginning of the business also was um, a book ended with a with some some family tragedy that uh, meant that it was a it was a pretty difficult start to business not only had you you and mum borrowed to get into business but uh, you also had um, the loss of my big brother and your son at the same time almost right as you were setting up the business yeah, well, we'd already made the commitment. All the loan stuff had been organised. We'd, um, you know, arranged through some support of some good people at AMP to purchase lots of equipment from the GIO offices, which were um, to furnish this office. And I had signed a contract to take this office space. And then, yeah, late February, the 27th of February, 2001, we. Uh, lost Clayton in a car accident early hours of the morning on that Tuesday and that was a fairly big disruptor but I think probably perversely it um, caused me I had because the business was so far down the track and I had no choice but to keep going with it it forced me to get my head out of feeling sorry for myself and getting on with getting the business working and, and at the same time Cody had arrived Clayton's son Cody had arrived six days before his dad passed so there was a responsibility there for him as well to make sure he was okay. So that uh, next few months was pretty crazy, pretty chaotic. But once we got past that period of time, just put my head down and got going with the business. But dealing with change and dealing with adversity. Yeah, and sliding doors. I mean, I've, 
the uh, that story of of Clayton uh, passing and you starting your business is really the reason I'm here. Like Correct. this is the reason yeah. I'm sitting in uh, the seat next to you as uh, as your business partner, as mm. a financial advisor myself, because uh, it wasn't. Um, I was nursing at the time, and I moved home uh, to help out with Cody, Correct. and uh, ultimately then gave you a hand with the books and whether it's six or nine months, 12 months later, said, uh, PB, I think, I might have called your dad back then, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I should do this. It's. Uh, I recall it really well, mate, because my first reaction was, no way, <laughs> no way. And uh, That's because I'm not good at maths. <laughs> no, the thought of um, having my son working in the business from there, I just thought, oh, no, it won't work, it won't work. But I then threw out this line, well, if you go off and talk to, I think it might have been Richard, you go and talk to Richard Hughes, I think it was still then he'd been moved on to take on the AMP management role for the area. Talk to Richard, and if you go off and do the qualifications, we'll see. And so you went off and did what you needed to do, and a few months later came back and said, I've done it. Goodness me. All right, you can have a desk. You can have a desk. <laughs> and a list of clients. <laughs> and a list of clients. You can work through the clients. You can have a desk. Um, and I think that probably the thing that um, we've taken out of that and talk about, you know, dealing with um, dealing with things, learning from experiences. I know when I started, like I said before, you know, just faxing bits of paper through was what my job was. And if I wanted to write a plan, I sat at the computer and terrible though my computer skills were, I had no choice but to put things into a plan. We didn't have power planners. We didn't have people, admin people doing it for us. And the, what that did for me was realize, made me realize how much I valued admin support once I had it. So I think from your perspective, go and have a desk and do what you need to do. And then for the next 12 or 18 months, you just did most of that stuff yourself too. And you learnt every single bit of the process, which I think accelerated your capacity to be a good planner and appreciate the support that the admin crew provide us and have done for us for a long time now. So let, let's fast track now from 2001 uh, through to uh, let's say 2008, 2010 period. So again, disruption in the industry. I mean, we've had over the 25 years a couple of milestone events mm. in in the industry. One of them, uh, well, from a business point of view, was we made some acquisitions of, of practices, but it also, uh, well unfortunately coincided with uh, a fairly significant downturn in the market with the GFC in 2008. Maybe just talk through what happened around that time, acquisition of some businesses and some of the things, even that predate that, that are now uh, legacies in our business today, positive legacies of how we've actually uh, set the business up. Well, I think that we uh, had this thought that we um, wanted to grow, we wanted to expand a bit and Having been a country boy myself, the idea of linking up with a country practice and sort of trying to take gradually taking over a country business seemed like a logical idea. And we've been having discussions with a practice up in Swan Hill because I had family there and it was a place I knew and I knew the, the principal of the practice up there. But then out of the blue, AMP were offering a pretty good deal for some planners to grab their buyer of last resort value, which was quite, they were enhancing it for some unreason, unknown reason at the time. And so out of the blue, I got a contact from another fellow that I knew in Shepparton who was looking to exit his business. And well, no, well, rightly or wrongly, we made a fairly quick decision. Bold. To buy, yeah, bold decision. Um, and not only we, did we take over the Secure Life entire client base from Wayne Limerick, but we also took over the entire office lease and everything from Wayne. And uh, I think what that did was gave us a chance to learn from some pretty big mistakes and it was a really good learning and it wasn't uh, thankfully it wasn't um, a terminal experience we didn't it wasn't fatal uh, we we battled a bit for a while but it also gave us a great learning on how to run things from a distance gave us a great learning on what we wanted our business to be like and when we looked at um, what the client base was and the old-fashioned way of running a business where it was all about um, trial commissions and invisible income coming in for the business, we decided, and we'd been thinking about it fairly seriously for a while, that we wanted to be a fee-for-service business, not just relying on this hidden trial commission. And we'd been doing that here in our business for quite some time. 
and our objective, I think, was to try and have you know 90% of our business as fee for service business. So we have a contract with the client. Client knows what they're getting. We know what we're delivering. Agreed position, and everyone was happy. And um, then all of a sudden, we took up this business in Shepparton that was all trail, relying on the value of the business was the value of the investments that the business had, and the trail was based on the value of the funds under management. Invested, funds under management, correct. And all of a sudden, we have the global financial crisis, seven, eight, and nine, which smashed the hell out of funds under management, which gave us um, a serious cash flow issue. But we soldiered through that, and it gave us a bit of a learning about how our our objective to try and focus on fee-for-service arrangements was was certainly the right thing to do. Then uh, maybe a couple of years later, we I think it was roughly early 2010, 11, um, another local planner who I'd known for a long, long time personally outside of planning and then through planning, Bruce Britton was keen to retire but didn't want to sell back to the dealer group. He wanted to have an arrangement with a local planner that he a local planning business so that he could actually hand his clients over gently and, and have confidence they'd be looked after. So we agreed with Bruce that we'd, that's how our business became Burke Britain. We um, took Bruce in and then gradually eased Bruce out, not um, deliberately, it was just, well, it was a, an agreed position, let Bruce ease out and he introduced all of his quality clients and we, but again found that that was a business largely built on trial commission, which was a good opportunity for us, but it was also a challenge to try and turn those clients into genuine clients who knew what we did for them and what we knew what we needed to do for them on a contract basis. So probably from that point, we started to realise that we had to be fairly aggressive about building our fee-for-service client book. And I think, speaking of books, one of the books that I was introduced to by a couple of my good mates way back around the beginning of our business was a book called Good to Great by Jim Collins and one of the key components of that book was about focusing on what you do really well, not trying to be good at, a little bit good at everything but be great at the key things and not to say we're great at things but just that was a, a focus or an intent. So we worked even more aggressively then at saying, right, what do we want to be? Who are the clients we want to have? Who are they? And what do we do the rest? So we started to talk to other practices about maybe taking up pieces of our client base that they might be able to make use of and might be able to look after better than we could so we could focus on building a much better relationship with the clients that we continue to look after now. And so that uh, that trail commission, and well, things are always fantastic with the benefit of hindsight, but I think we also had a bit of foresight with what was actually coming in the industry and that sort of brings us to the last maybe decade f mm. between sort of 2011 and 2021 where it was pretty clear industry-wide that uh, there was a, a, a movement to fee-for-service and uh, your, I think the figure you used was moving to a business that was 90% uh, fee-for-service or private fee-paying client was, was a fairly lofty goal at that point because we had a business that was predominantly trial commission from those two large businesses yeah, well it certainly dragged us back didn't it? we we were sort of pushing up to 70 75 percent and then we acquired secure life which dragged us back to well worse than 50 50 and we were then pushing up again to 70 75 percent and then we you know merged or acquired britain financial planning which dragged us back again um but i think we knew we knew we talked about it a bit that it was just not it was not favourable, you know, legislation down, government views down, and from a, even just from an ethical perspective, I couldn't see how we could justify collecting income that the client didn't know we were collecting that wasn't for a service we were delivering. And again, the, the whole thrust about professionalism, you know, you know, think about the need for education for planners now, but I think again if we want to put ourselves out to be a professional organization and compare ourselves with solicitors and accountants and um, medical people you know any profession out there that we have to have an agreed position that we do a job and we get paid for the job and it's not about just sitting on something and getting paid because we happen to have it on our list of clients that we look after and 
I mean, I made that, we made that decision fairly strongly to move aggressively away from picking up trail and having agreed positions with all of our clients. And yeah, there's a lot of clients, sorry, a lot of planners have complained about the circumstances over the last 18 months to two years where it's been pulled, the rug's been pulled out from under their feet. So maybe just explain that. So in terms of what's actually gone on in the last 18 months, uh, for those that don't know, what's, what's actually happened? Well, it was talked about and it was threatened and it was sort of always pending that it was going to happen. It was just about a date that it would happen, that they would take away the right to collect that income that you weren't doing anything for, like that trail commission, the income that just sat there as a, a percentage of the value of funds under management. Unless you were providing a service, then it was always going to be happening that you wouldn't be able to charge a fee. Like you had to provide a service for the fee. And to me that was common sense and it was the ethical, moral appropriate way to operate but still that was still happening for quite some time and in the last 18 months to two years legislatively ASIC and the government basically said no more and then all the dealer groups just had to stop so there was huge chunks of income for lots of practices lots of financial planning practices were just taken away from them in a in an instant and we were um, I think really really pleased because we dealt with things really well over the last decade or more that that impact on us was negligible. And that was not because we were lucky, it was because we planned to do the right things for a long time. And even going back to the beginning, I, my view was that I, when I started planning that I didn't want to be focusing on what it was that I was going to get paid, I wanted to focus on the service that I could provide. You know, And I think that's sort of legacy of you know, beautiful parents and grandparents who talked about community service. You know, you just if you do something, then you get rewarded for it. But if you don't do anything, you shouldn't get rewarded. And if you want to be rewarded, go out and do something. Like go out and deserve it. And I think we, as a business, tried to have that as our focus. And you end up being rewarded okay if you do the right stuff. But it's happened the last couple of years. All of a sudden, it you know, for some it seemed to be a shock, and for, I know a lot of people I've spoken to in 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 our group. 50, 50, 60 percent of their income was just taken from them, and they were carrying debt that no longer was serviceable because they hadn't didn't have the income. Well, it's never easy to lose any income, but if you aren't prepared to look forward and make changes to to see what the horizon looks like, you know, what a great book I read recently, Legacy, and it's, um, I think one of the concepts out of that was to say, this is about the all New Zealand All Blacks. As soon as you're on top of your game, find a way to change, find a way to improve, find a way to be better, and keep looking forward and saying, "What's, you know, anticipate." I think that um, you know the Stoic philosophy of not preparing or well, not um, anticipating in a negative way the next negative outcome, but just being aware that it's going to happen, that something's going to happen tomorrow. So let's be prepared for it. If you build in the resiliences and the strategies with everything you do, and I think that was our. Uh, you know, maybe it wasn't we didn't do it for a stoic reason, but we did it for a logical reason. We wanted to be a fee for service business because we felt that was the best way for us to sustainably provide a really good service for our clients and remove all of the legislative and market risk from what we do as a business, which means we can keep doing what we're doing for a lot longer because we're sustainable. And there's, you probably you may have answered this question indirectly but the secret to longevity so you're now 25 years in without aging it too quickly uh, 25 years into uh, this industry what what is what has been the key to your longevity not only the business but yourself personally um, I think continuing to uh, find ways to feel like you're improving and and can be valuable like no, knowing like if I get up in the mornings and feel like there's nothing I can add that will improve myself or the group we work with, our team, or the people that I assist with the work we do for them, our clients, well, it's a bit like when I was teaching. I suddenly felt like I was just treading water and I didn't want to keep treading water. I didn't want to be just turning up to get the paycheck and wait for another fortnight to get the paycheck. It needs to be more than that and I think that, again, come back to the good to great, book one of the beautiful things in that book that I remember vividly is the three intersecting circles that Jim Collins talks about and you have to have skill that's really important you have to have the skill which generates enough income at least to pay the bills because if you can't pay the bills you're not sustainable 
but the other circle that locks those two together and allows you to continue to grow and, and be sustainable and um, provide longevity is passion. You actually care about it, you know, if you really enjoy what you do and you get up and actually get excited about the things you're doing. And I'm blessed because I come to work and sit with awesome people and have great conversations about their life, good and bad, you know, you're in a very privileged position with what we do as planners. Is the uh, the really personal, intimate stuff that we get to discuss with our clients. That's way outside of just the dollars and cents of their investments. Um, that's something that you you know can't ever do, can't take for granted, and you continue to have to think as a real privilege. So I think that probably longevity is staying healthy for a start. Like I'm lucky, I've stayed healthy, apart from arthritis, um, and I've continued to enjoy what I do. And I think we change, like we've been prepared to make, adapt, you know, and, I, and life is a series of crappy events. So life's a series of road humps and road blocks and big potholes. And you can get bogged in them and think, well, I can't, or you can fear changing direction because it, it might be a bit difficult. But if you don't take the, make the effort to change, if you don't take those risks and step outside your comfort zone, well, you will just wither. Is it uh, Russ Never Sleeps? Well, <coughs> Russ Never Sleeps. <laughs> we haven't got a name for the podcast yet, but uh, one of one of our favourite uh, favoured uh, names was uh, Russ Never Sleeps. I was actually listening to. Well, it's not a song, is it? It's an album. Well, it's, it's Russ Never Sleeps is the name of an album, but um, there's a song called Out of the Blue into the Black, which is Neil Young talking about. Or is it Hey Hey My My? Hey Hey My My, Out of the Blue into the Black. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's it. And there's two versions. There's the electronic version and the acoustic version. But that song has got a, a variety of different ways of saying it's better to burn out than rust away because rust never sleeps. Uh, I was listening to it earlier. I think in the, uh, el- the hardcore version of it, yeah. he says rust never sleeps. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so and Neil Young, you d- listen to him live and he'll, he varies that line a fair bit and I... I um, carried that little tattoo on my chest after my Kokoda journey with yourself, Jay, and my brother David, and your father-in-law, Mal, my good mate, Malcolm. And we shared a wonderful Kokoda experience, and at the end of it, I had... My brother and I both got a tattoo to commemorate our survival of Kokoda, David and I, and uh, David's was better to die on your feet than live on your knees that was his thing and mine was it's better to burn out than rust away so I think um, that's what we've done as a business we you know we don't stand still we've chosen to keep trying to evolve and adapt and continue to be aware of where if we're standing still we're going to lose momentum where if we're standing still we'll just wither and not be relevant you've got to try and keep being relevant and I think once upon a time, I had this ego about things needing to be PB-centric, but I think I've learnt fairly quickly that it's important to delegate, it's important to empower, it's important to give ownership to people that you work with so that they can actually add value and feel like their, their views, their opinions are relevant and important. And who would ever have thought that I'd be sitting doing a podcast? <laughs> My God! <laughs> and I, and it wouldn't be it wouldn't be happening if it were up to me to decide that. So that's why it's important to, you know, to pass the baton to people like yourself, mate, and and let the decisions about what we do as a business not be you know bogged in an old man's head who's still living with too many things from the past. It's well, important. To I think that might be one of the answers to your longevity is that you have always. Uh, surrounded yourself with uh, quality people like myself, uh, <laughs> but but actually surrounding yourself with people that are uh, well that are that are better in you in areas that uh, you're not good at. And I think one of um, peop- one of the men that I respect greatly, not that I know this fellow personally very well, I've met him a few times and really enjoy his company when I've had the chance. A bloke called Kevin Sheedy who was an AFL coach for an amazingly long time and I remember him being questioned about how do you stay relevant for so long in such a cutthroat industry and very self-deprecatingly as Kevin is capable of being he said you just have to have lots of people around you that are much smarter than you and they make you look good and you can stay relevant if you don't have an ego about needing to be the person who gets all the pats on the back. And that to me, again, that's a good good to great Jim Collins principle as well about 
empowering the people that you have with you and having really good quality people and letting them know that they do matter and they are relevant and they can have an input. Um, and you'll share the journey then. That's a really good, fun way to do it. Now, we're going to have to wrap up because I think I've got some work to do. <laughs> but uh, we're going to close off with a couple of things. So just your thoughts. Let's see if we can do it uh, reasonably, ra- reasonably <laughs> rapid fire. But your thoughts around uh, what financial planning. Oh, you've talked about how you started, faxing mm-hmm. checks, the contrast between that and today. Like what is, in your mind, what is financial planning? What is it? Like what if you have to define what financial planning is, uh, what is it? I think if, you know, again, I, I, I could probably think about it and I'll probably come up with about 10 different answers if I thought about it for a bit longer. But um, quickly off the cuff, I think it's more about just being the gatekeeper, the counsellor, someone that can be the Jiminy Cricket perhaps, you know, those those three phrases. The gatekeeper to lots of information, lots of sourcing of um, opportunities for clients. I think the counsellor role... Um, Look, financial planning or investments is, is very hygiene these days. Anyone can jump on a website or a, an app somewhere and invest. You know, I've got my own little raise app that I just do out of interest, you know. But that isn't financial planning. Financial planning is where you and I sit down and we have a discussion. And a lot of it is the really personal, intimate stuff. And so getting a balance between the pure financial and the personal and making those things work so that over a period of time, not only do you look, after the client's financial best interest but you allow them to enjoy that along the way and actually feel like they're having an input and succeeding in their own outcomes and the flow on to that from for one segment of uh financial planning which i think is relevant to you because i know you're thinking about it uh how do you think about retirement in the sense of uh financial planning you've given advice to people for 25 years about retirement how does it look when you're in the driver's seat yeah, good. Um, and I, again, where we've got the opportunity, where we've got the choice, I think easing yourself out of the workforce, and I'm blessed you're still allowing me to do that. And, <laughs> and you'll tell me, you and the guys here, Amy and the crew will tell me when I'm no longer relevant, and I'll happily accept that. But um, I think if you can gradually ease yourself out so it's not a cold turkey thing, because that's in my 25 years and even prior to that without knowing it was about people's wellness and people's financial well-being um, you see people that just stop work and it's almost like they stop work and that retirement word is almost the death of them and I, I and retirement I think I almost would prefer not to use the word retire I would prefer, prefer to use the word just transitioning to a different phase of your life it's a different focus on what you are doing in your life and how do we do that we need to have financial well-being so we can actually change the direction of our life away from turning up each day at work to have enough money go into the bank account each fortnight to pay the bills to a point where we have passive income that will meet our needs and capital that we can draw down on so that we can have that post work period in our life without our lifestyle and the quality of our life having to change and it should change in a positive way because we can actually get a buzz out of all that stuff that we'd love to do. But I suppose the other key thing is not waiting until you stop work to do the things you want to do. Um, life is about an uncertainty. You know, tomorrow's not promised. And so then the other thing I think we, I've, I've found in our lives, you know, you and I both in particular, but this business and people that work with us, have had our experiences through us that you can't promise anyone tomorrow so there's really important stuff to do whether that be just telling people that you love them going places doing things finding some small thing reading that book you've always wanted to read or at the bucket list of somewhere you'd like to visit you just have to do it you know you have to do it each day and try and make sure that each day there's some small thing that you've done that puts a smile on your face your own it's a bit self-centered but you've got to put a smile on your own face and the best way to do that is put a smile on other people's faces because the feedback of positive energy is a wonderful thing. Well, I think that's a good way to wrap it up, PB. Uh, thanks very much. Well done. Congratulations on 25 years. Thanks, mate. And gra- Thank congratulations you. on your first podcast. <laughs> I love you heaps. Thanks, Dad. Uh, Cheers. Uh,
better to burn out than to fade away. My, my, hey, hey. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, listeners should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right, hit it. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility. Do your homework. Ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorized representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.